It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Mr. Peter Hurst, Associate Dean, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Sir, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are in the world and welcome to the 23rd webinar in uh, the Innovation at Work webinar series. I'm Peter Hurst, I'm the Associate Dean of Executive Education at the MIT Sloan School of Management uh, and I'm here with uh, Bob Posen who is a Senior Lecturer at MIT Sloan and also a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. The webinar, work, uh, webinar series uh, is one of the ways that we try to bring insights from our world-renowned faculty at MIT Sloan uh, to you around the world. Uh, our webinars feature current researchers and professors uh, at, at MIT, uh, and in the case of Bob Posen, Bob teaches uh, in uh, one of our highly uh, attended and regarded courses by the same or similar title on extreme productivity, and is also the author of a really uh, useful book on this subject. We'll talk more a little bit about that later. Uh, Bob's an extremely successful and distinguished uh, executive in his own right before he joined uh, the MIT Sloan School. Uh, you can see on the current slide uh, some of his significant responsibilities, President of Fair Delta Investments, uh, Executive Chairman of MS MFS Investment Management, for example, still serves on a number of boards and advisory roles uh, and uh, is a, continues to be extremely productive, uh, as you can see. Uh, so, with, without further ado, I would like to hand the computer back over to uh, Bob and let him take his presentation away. Well, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. Uh, you did forget my high school basketball career, but we'll move over that quickly. So, uh, let's uh, begin with this question is, are you overwhelmed by your obligations at work, to your family, to your friends? I think the answer for most of us is yes. Uh, and my basic thesis is that one of the main reasons why we're not able to be productive is most organizations are still counting hours. Uh, of course, there are accountants and lawyers who bill by the hours, but uh, there are many organizations that don't bill by the hour that still look and see, did you come in the office at 9 o'clock and leave at 6 o'clock or leave at 8 o'clock. And uh, this emphasis on hours is understandable. It's understandable because it's historically the way we do it, and uh, it's also very easy to measure. But actually, it's a terrible way to think about how an organization should run. Uh, most of us are working in knowledge-based organizations. And so the idea that hours are a good proxy for what we produce is really crazy. Uh, I often have journalists ask me this question and I say, haven't you ever spent uh, three weeks on an article and it really came out and it wasn't very good? And on the other hand, you've sometimes spent uh, three days on an or uh, article and it was really great. Uh, which is the more productive use of your time? So. How do we get to off hours and into something that's much more functional? In my view, uh, the manager of every team or every organization needs to get together, discuss objectives in depth, and then set metrics for success. So this is a way you get off hours into success metrics. It's probably not feasible for most organizations just to give up hours, they need something to replace it. And this is what I'm recommending to replace it. This is a way in which you focus on your objectives and then everyone knows at the end of the week or the month or the six months, what are the metrics for success? And we can look at those and see whether or not uh, we achieved what we thought were important objectives. So that's the main system that I'm preaching, performance-based productivity with metrics. And let's look at the three big ideas uh, that uh, go along with this. So the first big idea is to write down your goals and prioritize them. It's surprising how few people do this. 
you start writing your goals for the next year and then you try to integrate them into the week. Uh, of course, you need in looking at your goals to think about what you're best at and what's important to you. On the other hand, you have to take into account what the world needs, what I call the demand function. And in the end, you ought to have goals that are for your work and goals that are for your personal life. And the key is to actually try to achieve these goals by spending most of your time on these goals. Regrettably, through a lot of surveys, we see that most people say they spend only 30 to 40 percent of their time on what they say are their top goals. So that's clearly not a great allocation of time. The second idea is related to the first is how come people are spending so little of their time on what they say are the most important goals? And the answer comes in part from the fact that they say we have so much small stuff that overwhelms us. And that's what we wind up using our time for. And there are different categories of this. There are what I call the objective or organizational categories. And probably the most important one is email. Uh, most of us get many, many too many emails. And a lot of us spend a lot of our time looking at emails. There have been various surveys in which people say they look at their email every three minutes or every five minutes. If you do that, you'll spend most of your day looking at your emails. So this is my approach to emails. First is try to keep yourself from looking at them every few minutes. Look at them every hour or two hours. I don't think it's realistic to go eight hours a day without looking at them, but an hour or two hours is a reasonable uh, time period. Second of all, when you do look at them, just look at the subject matter and the sender and essentially skip over 60 to 80 percent of them. Most of the emails we get are really not very useful and we can tell that just by looking at the sender and the uh, subject. And third of all, uh, the rule that I call Ohio, this does not stand for a football team, this stands for only handle it once. And if some of those emails are really important, then answer them right then and there. If you get an email from your boss, from your spouse, or say the IRS, you should answer it right away. Uh, the person on the other side will feel that you care about them, and you won't have to later on think about, well, did I really answer that important email? And where is that email? So you can spend a lot of time just trying to find the email that was important that you didn't answer last week. The other categories of small stuff have to do with things inside yourself. We have people who are perfectionists. What do I mean by that? They spend a lot of time getting the detail right, even for things where their audience doesn't care. What's a good example? Activity reports. Uh, many organizations Require activity reports every week or every month, but no one reads it. So if it's not important, don't spend a lot of time on that. A more complicated problem is procrastination. People tend to be procrastinators, even people who are relatively productive, and there are a wide variety of reasons that come about and that cause uh, procrastination. Uh, but Here's the basic learning is most people procrastinate because they have a hard time getting started or they're just sort of overwhelmed by the task. So break it into a few easy pieces, especially start with an easy one. Once you get started and you can do a piece, you'll feel good and get on to the next one. So don't be overwhelmed, break it into pieces and move it forward slowly. Third of all, what about the big projects that are high priority projects? How do we get them done in the most efficient way? If someone were to ask you, for instance, 
uh, let's think about where we ought to put another branch office uh, and gave you two months to research that. Most people would spend six or seven weeks researching it, gathering data, speaking to people, and then in the last week or two, they would try to synthesize that and come up with what they viewed as the key answers. Well, I'm here to say that that's actually a very inefficient way to handle these big research projects. Why? Well, if you gather all this research and you wait to the last seven or eight weeks, the last seventh or eighth week, you will often find that you gather lots and lots of data that turn out to be irrelevant. On the other hand, uh, you won't have come to grips with the critical analytic questions that underlie most projects, and therefore you won't have gathered the most important uh, information, and there you are at the end having spent all this time without uh, the key information. So what I ask people to do after at most two days of research is to sit down and write their tentative conclusions or at least the critical factors for this project. Now most people tell me they can't possibly do that because they won't know enough at the end of two days. But the answer is that's not correct. After two days of research, you'll know a lot, but these are only tentative conclusions. They're not meant to be definitive. But what they do do are two things. One is they force you to come to grips with the key analytic problems that underlie the project. And second of all, they provide a focus for your future gathering of data. You can discard certain things and focus on others. But it's critical to have a mid-flight in this case, we would ask someone to have a review every two weeks, go over their tentative conclusions, revise them, refocus, re-understand the critical questions and come forward. So by the time you got to the seventh week, you would have rewritten your final conclusions uh, three times, and you really have been focused on the key analytic issues. And you'll be able to write your conclusions with the right data. So those are the three big ideas that uh, I'm preaching and that are uh, I teach in my course and in my book, Extreme Productivity. So let's now go through the typical day in the life of a busy executive and see how some of these big ideas would apply to that daily routine. So let's begin with the calendar. Now, most people have a calendar that looks like the left side of this slide that's up there. It includes the time and the appointment. So you would be listing all of your possible times and all of your possible appointments all in an orderly fashion. But Look at this uh, uh, appointment schedule and you'll see that there are two important differences. One is not every hour is scheduled. In fact, for emphasis, I've added at 1.30 thinking time. There are lots of busy executives that I know that have a little card with all of their meetings and phone calls every day and essentially every hour is pre-scheduled. That, in my view, is a big mistake. You need downtime, first of all, to think. Thinking is part of most people's jobs. So sometimes if they go through the process uh, by uh, meeting every hour, or talking to people every hour, and they don't have time to think. And, of course, you need contingencies. Things happen, either things at work or things at home. And so you need to have some amount of time, I would suggest an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon that's not scheduled. The other important difference about this schedule is that it has on the right side the purpose of the meeting. This is uh, your attempt to relate what these meetings and phone calls are about to your highest priorities. 
so that when you go to these meetings and you can have these phone calls, you'll be thinking about what you want to get out of that. A lot of people go through the day, going through meetings, phone calls, and essentially they're responding to other people's priorities. And so they go to the meeting that someone else called, and they sit there and they listen to what that person wants. Well, if we want people to focus on their priorities, this is a little device to help them think about for every meeting and every appointment, what do they want to get out of it. <clears throat> the morning routine, uh, I strongly believe that cutting down your sleep to five or six hours is not a way to increase your productivity. There's been a lot of study of this issue and they all come out the same. If you only sleep five or six hours, then most of the time, your performance on complex tasks will decline. And here's the really dangerous part. You won't actually realize it. You won't think that your performance is declining, but it is. <clears throat> when you get up in the morning, I advocate that you try to be a very boring person. What do I mean by boring? I mean try to routinize the things that are not important to you. I, for example, don't care what I have for breakfast, so I have the same breakfast every morning. Cheerios, skin milk, and a banana. Now, that means I don't have to think, am I going to have scrambled eggs? Am I going to have an omelet? Am I going to have something else? Am I going to have pancakes? I'm not thinking about that. I'm not using any of my time or energy doing this. And this is a more general principle. That is, the things that are not important to you try to routinize. I read an article that said that President Obama had five blue suits and exactly the same shirts and exactly the same ties. So he didn't want to, want to think every day about what he was going to wear. So he always knew he would bring, he would be wearing a blue suit. Uh, with the same tie and the same shirt. So that's another example of reducing the amount of energy and time that you spend on decisions that are routine. Of course, if you were in the fashion industry, it wouldn't take President Obama's approach. But for him, it was very functional. <clears throat> another thing I think that's important is to recharge daily. There are a lot of people who exercise first thing in the morning or in the evening. That actually turns out not to be a particularly good time to exercise. That's because if you exercise very early in the morning, actually you already have a lot of energy. If you exercise very late at night, sometimes it makes it harder for you to go to sleep. The key time to exercise is sometime in the afternoon. Most people have a body low. It can be anywhere from 1 to 4 o'clock. But the evidence is compelling that if during that time you do any significant exercise, and I don't mean play basketball, I mean take a walk around the block or go for a swim, uh, that you will be re-energized for the rest of the day. And if you can't exercise, at least take a mental break and stop doing work for a while and really focus on uh, just letting yourself go, uh, letting yourself relax, and do this for a 15 minute or half an hour period, and then you'll be much more energized for the rest of the day. Uh, one thing that I want to deal with and that's so important uh, is meetings. Uh, meetings are uh, probably, along with email, uh, one of the key factors that keeps people from being productive. There are a lot of people who tell me they just go from one meeting to another and um, it consumes so much of their time that they don't uh, have enough time to do the work. So we can think about this as to what constitutes a bad meeting and what constitutes a good so here's, here's a basic summary of a bad meeting. You come to the meeting 
And then as you walk in the door, somebody hands you two feet of paper and says, this is what the meeting's about. Well, of course, it's too late. You can't possibly prepare. So it's a little crazy to get all that paper. So instead, you have a dominating boss who spends most of the meeting putting up PowerPoint to tell you what's in that big pack of papers. So by the time you get toward the end of the meeting, finally, your boss says, okay, let's have some discussion. So that's really bad because the point of the meeting is to have discussion. The point of the meeting is not to look at PowerPoints uh, put up by the boss. <clears throat> Another thing about a bad meeting is it takes too long. There are so many meetings that I'm invited to that people say they're going to take three or four hours. And I say very nicely, uh, look, I glad to go to the first 90 minutes, but then I have some very urgent business that I have to take care of. What I'm really saying is, after 90 minutes, most meetings become unproductive. Again, there's a lot of evidence that people's attention span doesn't really last beyond 90 minutes. And so, if you have a meeting that goes on and on, people are falling away and really not getting a good result. Last thing about a bad meeting is there are so many meetings where people walk away and they say, I have no idea what was decided at the meeting. And so people think, hmm, I wonder what we should do from here. That's really bad. If you're going to have a meeting, people ought to end the meeting by understanding what's been decided and what has to happen. So by contrast, let's look at a good meeting. A good meeting material comes in advance and uh, you have an agenda so you know what the meetings are going to be about. You have a chance to read the material and the meeting proceeds on the assumption that everyone has read the material. That's critical. If someone uh, starts walking through the material then after a while people are going to say, why should I bother reading this material in advance? The leader of the meeting at the meeting should spend, say, 10 or 15 minutes teeing up the issues and putting forward what we need to decide in a possible direction. I like to call this the rebuttable hypothesis, saying, uh, look, here's the problem. Here are several possible solutions. I sort of tend to think maybe this one works, but I'm not really sure. So let's have good discussion. About the issues, and then really encourage discussion and debate by if somebody makes a good point, the leader should go out of his or her way to say, gee, that's a really great point. Uh, the leader might ask some of the junior members uh, of the meeting uh, to speak out and get their opinion because they might be reluctant to do it. That's the point of the meeting to have a discussion and debate and to come up with stuff that no individual might come up with. And then at the end of the meeting, which of course occurs uh, at before 90 minutes, there should be good closure. What do I mean by good closure? I mean <clears throat> someone should be very specific about what's been decided, and then the group as a whole should come together and delineate what are the next steps that need to be taken. And someone should walk out of that room with the responsibility for uh, these uh, uh, to-dos and a time frame to do them. <clears throat> Another thing that's really important to productivity is to get a good team. And that's because delegation is a key aspect of productivity. There's only so much that you can do yourself. Getting a good team getting them to do a lot and to feel good about it is critical. So uh, here are some of the you know, points uh, in terms of developing your own team to own your own space. What do I mean by own your own space? I mean that they need to think of what they're doing as if they had their own business, as if they have their own p &L. It's up to them to get stuff done and to get it done right. They can't
can't have the attitude that they're just following the instructions of the leader. Otherwise, things will really bog down. So what do you have to do? First is to hire the right people. If you have the right people, your life is easy. If you have the wrong people, your life is difficult. You try to make them more productive. You get into lots of discussion. In the end, you may have to terminate them, and they'll sue you. So that's really a bad result. Train them in the key areas. Set goals and agree on metrics. This goes back to our basic idea of a performance-based system with metrics. And then once you set the metrics, let them run. Don't come over their desk every hour or every day. You set metrics for a week or a month, so you'll be able to see whether they produced what everyone agreed uh, were the metrics of success. And you have to tolerate new mistakes. Why do I say new mistakes? Good faith mistakes, not, not illegal, not unethical. They always happen in every team. And so <clears throat> learn from them and prevent them from happening again. But let's not have them happen again. I always like to say that let's make a new mistake because if we make an old mistake, job of preventing the problems that we've seen. <clears throat> Another key aspect of productivity is reading and writing. These are the opposite of these team exercises in meetings and in uh, recruitment and delegation. But they have to do with your own personal skills and how productive you can be. So. If you can read effectively, that's really good. There are lots of people who take a long time to read. When I run this executive course, we measure how long people take to read. And reading the same thing, sometimes people take four times as much as the fastest reader. So why is that? Well, uh, the first thing in reading effectively is to know why you're reading something. You could be reading something for all sorts of uh, rationales. You could be reading something because you want to get the main thesis. You could be reading something because you want to look for further research, so you want to have look at the footnotes. You could be reading something so you just want to uh, you want to get uh, uh, the insight into the person's logical reasoning. So. If you begin by delineating your purpose, then you read the introduction, you read the conclusions, and then you'll have a pretty good idea about whether or not this article uh, is, or this memo is really relevant and germane to your main purpose. Then you can go back through the body of the articles and see what are the topic sentences of each paragraph and whether or not they are relevant to your purpose. So if you get your purpose clearly, then you get a fix on the article or the memo to see whether it serves your purpose, and then you can skip through. I say I read the Boston Globe in five minutes every morning, and people say, how can you possibly do that? And I say the answer is I'm just reading the front page to get the main political uh, uh, things events that have happened uh, in the Commonwealth, and then I'm trying to figure out uh, whether the Boston sports teams won. That's all I'm trying to do. So I have a very limited purpose, so I can quickly do the reading. What about writing? That's the other thing. <clears throat> My experience is that lots of people have trouble writing. Uh, in every class I've taught, we have some speed readers, but we really have a speed writer. And people say, well, the age of the internet, you don't need to write. Well, that's crazy. Every executive I've ever talked to say, we need good written work, short memos that really uh, explicate what the issues are and help us uh, work through them. So in my view, uh, the main problem with writing is that people don't realize that it's two distinct processes. They tend to push them together. Uh, what do I mean? I think, first of all, 
you need to understand and think through what the logic of your argument is, what the logic of what you're trying to say is. So that's a thinking problem. And second of all, once you get that down, there's a, what I call a translation problem. Translation means that's how you take that idea and translate it into words that people can think really conveys, really uh, is persuasive. So how do you do this? Well, I'm like president of the Outlines Club. I hope you'll all join in with me. That will all put together a short outline, less than a page, before we write anything of significance. Why do I say that? An outline gives you a chance to think through the logic of your argument, the step-by-step -step way that you're going to go from introduction to conclusion. If you get that down, then you can uh, uh, spend the rest of your time in the translation process, which is difficult, and try to figure out how to get those sentences and paragraphs to be the clearest you can and the most persuasive. <clears throat> the other thing is people have to be willing to write rough drafts. This is sort of an aspect of perfectionism. We see some people who spend all their time rewriting the first or second sentence over and over again. That's really not productive. Get it all out, get a draft, and then you'll have to revise it. But the main message for writers is write for good readers. Keep it short and to the point. Get a good introduction and a conclusion because you're assuming that people are going to jump from the introduction to the conclusion. And then, in the body of strong topic senses, that makes it very easy for people to move quickly and skim as readers and get to the right point uh, quickly. <clears throat> Last thing I want to talk about is going home. Why do I want to talk about this? Because people always ask me, about work-life balance. How can they balance their personal life with all their obligations and work? Well, I, I've headed a number of large organizations, and I can say proudly that on most days, almost all days when I wasn't traveling, I would leave uh, the office at 6.30 and get home at 7 o'clock to have dinner with my family. And I'm proud of that because it's so easy for people to stay late at work till 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Some people told me they would work every night until 10 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night. And I asked them, why is that? And they say, well, you know, I just have so many emergencies that come up. There's so many urgent things. Uh, I really wonder, can you have an emergency every day? Right? Or is this just an aspect of FaceTime where people are proud that they stay late at their office so it makes them feel that they're really productive? I've had people say to me, I'm afraid to re leave the office at 5.30 even though I've done all my work because people look at me very strangely. It turns out that those people might have been playing video games the whole day. So maybe they didn't do their work. Or maybe they went to meetings all day. So it's only at 5.30 they can start their work. Well, that's really not a great answer. So you've got to get disciplined to, most of the time, get home at a reasonable hour and try to have dinner with your family. I can definitely assure you that, you know, kids grow up quickly and before you know it, uh, you'll really regret it if you don't have that family time. Now, of course, I would, after... 9.30 or 10 o'clock, go to my home office, and especially when I was running a global organization, uh, have some phone calls or other things across the world. So I'm not saying that you just go home and forget about everything, but you need those two or three hours of really high-quality time. How do you get that? Well, one thing not to do is not to come into dinner and immediately start taking phone calls 
unplug your electronics, stop at the door before you walk in, and go through your emails and phone calls so that by the time you are there in the house and at dinner, you can actually focus for two or three hours on what it is that's really important to your family. And I think that this whole approach that I'm preaching, performance goals together with success metrics, is very consistent with work-life balance. Because when you talk to people, the thing that they're most concerned about is the rigidity of hours. Uh, they're willing to work hard, but they want some flexibility on time. How do you get flexibility on time? Well, if you have agreement on goals and success metrics for the next week or next month, well then your, your boss or the organization should give you flexibility on time. Because the key is what will be produced at the end of the period and you'll have success metrics so everyone can know whether or not uh, you achieve those goals. So this is the great beauty of the performance-based system with metrics. It not only focuses the organization on what's really important, it not only gets consensus among the people on the team as to what they need to do and how everyone agrees you're going to measure success, but it allows you a work-life balance environment where no one cares, therefore, whether you're coming in at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. If you are achieving those success metrics, it's up to you to figure out how to do that in the most productive manner. So, <clears throat> in closing, I want to say that you know, we, we all have situations, and we've all been in situations where people will say to me, you know, my boss won't allow me to go to a performance basis with system or metrics, or the organization isn't receptive to it. Well, you've got to work on that. You've got to work with your boss and work with the organization. But remember, your boss is an employee. Your boss has a boss, so your boss understands these situations because he or she has been through them. You need to communicate, discuss these issues with your boss. And you can lay it on me, tell them that this guy from MIT told you that a performance-based system of metrics will achieve a lot more for the organization uh, and uh, people will be a lot happier. I'm going to stop there and we're going to take uh, questions. Peter's going to Great. Thanks very much, Bob. I'll just slide in here and get, get us both in the frame. Okay. Uh, and so now we're going to move into uh, a question and answer session. Uh, and thank you for everybody who has been sending in questions as we have been going through this very interesting presentation, Bob. I've been trying to process them uh, <laughs> and so I can uh, perhaps start asking you. But just uh, you touched a fair amount there talking about uh, still needing to work uh, in many cases from home, uh, not on your personal family time. How, that seems to relate very much to this idea of telecommuting as well. That's something we've been doing at MIT recently, is allowing people a lot more flexibility to work remotely, which usually means at home. Uh, so how do you uh, manage to balance uh, that? What do you think about telecommuting? Is it a good idea? And how does it interplay with this issue of being always on 24-7? Well, that's a good question, uh, Peter, and I'm a big advocate of telecommuting. I think it's very consistent with performance-based metrics and success metrics because it's really saying you're going to be able to get stuff done uh, as you think is appropriate and without the drag of a commute. You know, I, I noticed that in some uh, companies they insist on people being there eight to six every day, even though a lot of people are commuting one hour each way. And uh, that's a lot of downtime, uh, especially before we have self-driving cars. Yes. So uh, we don't want people working while they're driving. But uh, people will argue, well, we need, we need everybody to be there at certain times. And I would agree with that. But you can have a middle ground. You could say to people, for instance, we need you to come in every Monday and Thursday because that's when the various people are going to 
be. That's when we're going to have this interactivity that a lot of people think is important for creativity. But, you know, people can't be creative every day. That's just not realistic. And then there are a lot of people who have jobs that really aren't creative jobs. So we need to be sensible about this and have, uh, you know, a good balance. The last thing I want to say is video conferencing, the quality of video conferencing last five years is just so much better. And so uh, I once was supposed to go to a meeting in Minneapolis, but we got snowed in Boston, so I did a video conference. And I realized that it was so good, I really felt like I was there. And it would have been just a total waste of my time to fly into Minneapolis and back on the same day. Uh, so I think that's another thing that people can do, uh, even uh, you know on a regular basis and maybe there could be a few distributed sites for videos and do that. Great. You know, it seems there's a very uh, direct connection between uh, your, your advice to try to set sort of realistic and achievable goals and have those be uh, agreed versus the tension with the fact that it always seems like there's a lot more that one could be doing and that this is where we're in an increasingly competitive work world and uh, we maybe many of us feel like if uh, others are outworking us, not only in terms of uh, the ability to be productive, but also the number of hours they're putting in uh, to do that, then even if we're achieving all of the goals that we thought we'd set out for ourselves, there's always more that we could be doing. Well, there there are a lot of different threads in what you're saying. Is I would first say that uh, if most people, most organizations could be more efficient about producing what they say are their top priorities, uh, they would get a lot more accomplished. Uh, another thing is uh, that um, I think that this very discussion of what it is that we're going to mean by these various priorities and how are we going to judge success is a great clarifying event for most organizations. Let's take something really simple like I used to run financial services for him. You say, okay, let's improve customer service for the next month. Well, who's against that? No one. But the question is, what do we mean by that? Are we going to, for instance, uh, reduce the number of mistakes? Are we going to pick up the phone faster? Are we going to go out and visit more clients and more customers? So those are three very different notions of customer service. They're all valid. But having that discussion then forces the group to come to grips with that and clarify what are the, the real highest priorities for customer service and who should do them and what order should they be done. So I think that uh, this very process of setting performance uh, success metrics really helps the organization get to be a lot more productive by forcing uh, more agreement on uh, what we're going to do, what's the order we're going to do that, uh, how we're going to do it. In, in your experience, how much how much time, uh, given everything that you just said, what proportion of time should we be spending planning versus doing? Well, I would say the answer is more time planning than doing. And of course, it takes more time uh, at the beginning uh, to have, let's say, an hour meeting team and decide what are the real priorities here and what are the success metrics. And so it seems in a very superficial sense that the boss sends out and says something, let's, you know, we're all going to be improving customer service, so uh, we'll need it. It seems like it's spending less time, but it really isn't because people are going off doing all different things and nobody quite knows what the real priorities are. So uh, I guess I feel you know, like start off by doing an hour more of planning uh, twice a week and see how much that does. And by planning, I don't mean just one individual sitting in a room. I mean the team getting together and trying to think through clearly what are the priorities here? What do we really think is most important? And how the success matter, how are we going to know whether or not we, in fact, achieve these priorities. It's that second part that really forces an understanding and a discipline in the group, and it's that second part that frees you up for work-life balance. 
it's interesting listening to you to, dis to your answer here. You, you, you talk a lot about the team uh, and the group. If right. you look back at, at, at your very distinguished career, have you seen a shift from very hierarchical organizational structures where really I was accountable to my boss uh, to one where increasingly I'm accountable to my team? Well, I, I, think, I think that's the, the, one of the key trends that's happened, you know, the notion of, you know, sort of maybe at General Motors that you just told everybody what to do. I mean, in most knowledge-based organizations, that isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the people are very smart, they're mobile, they want to feel a sense of ownership. And so unless you can get a team involved, you're going to find that people just aren't going to stay. Uh, of course, there's some, in, you know, individual performance involved. But I would say in coaching people, you know, who move up to be CEO, I found that the most difficult thing for people who have done, who are great individual performers, is to then put themselves into the role of the team leader or the CEO. And it's a very different sort of thing. Uh, they really have to learn how to delegate. They have to learn how to give up control. And they have to learn to let other people do things that they might actually do better but they're not a very good use of your time. So if you're a CEO, you might be the best person, for instance, to pick a new brand because you're a ace marketing person, but that doesn't mean that it's the best use of your time. You have to think about what you and only you as the CEO or as the head of the unit can do and very focused on those things. So, so even if somebody on your team has not implemented something quite the way that you would if you don't even put the time into it, then you should let them get on with it. Yeah, uh, unless it's, you know, obviously, you don't want somebody to screw up the system. And do this. But, you know, you, you gotta, you have to be realistic about that. And you, know, you can't say, well, here are four tasks. I'm the boss. I can do each one of them better than anyone in my team. And therefore, I ought to do them and not delegate them. Well, then you'll wind up with a monkey on your back. It also would say something about the team you don't think any of them uh, are really uh, competent to do it. I always like to say, I like to have a team where there are people in every area who know more than I do and who are better at it. And I feel very comfortable about delegating. I know that we're getting a better product. Great. Great. So let's um, uh, dive a little bit more into a couple of the uh, techniques that you've sure. been, uh, been advising. You know, your your um, big projects uh, advice of formulating uh, early hypotheses and, and then trying to sort of uh, validate them and, and, and evolve from them. Uh, some people are wondering whether that's at odds with what we often teach, which is you know don't go to don't rush into solutions until you've explored the space enough. How do you balance those two things? Yeah. Are you cutting off good ideas if you go too quickly to a solution? Well, that's that's a valid question, and I think we have to understand that what we're, what I'm advocating is at the end of two days to come up with uh, preliminary uh, conclusions or uh, hypothesis that here are the three critical factors and what to do. And second of all, that every few weeks you're going to have, a, you know, a mid-flight review in which you're going to revise the whole thing. So you really, you're really in the process. And so if during the first two weeks you turns out that one of the factors you thought was critical isn't really that critical and something else is critical, and you revise it. So um, there is a balance between, you know, looking at everything and focus. So if you can focus, have the discipline to write out your technical conclusions and then be ready to revise them every few weeks in light of you're doing. That's the key. Right. That's the way in which you won't cut off some great idea that mm -hmm. you didn't happen to see in the first two days. Are, are there any things that you do yourself to uh, try to prevent yourself from anchoring on that first idea? Uh, or, or indeed, if you're working with a team, how, how do you uh, keep the mind open? Yeah, so, so one possibility is when you have these uh, mid-flight reviews, you have a team, you have meeting, ask someone to play the role of devil's advocate and ask them to say, okay, uh, here you've gone this way, but uh, how come you're not uh, 
considering this? How come you're not considering that? And so that sort of forces the team uh, not to just uh, uh, play uh, ball together, but just, you know, there's someone there who's trying to sort of shake it up. Right. Great. Another of the tools that you showed us in your slides was the idea, uh, which seems incredibly simple, um, but also apparently very effective, of just trying to plan your day uh, more effectively. We've had a few questions from people that, you know, personally, do you try to design the flow of your day as well so that you can be optimally, sort of have the optimal mindset for these different tasks? Well, I try to some degree. There are people who are morning people, there are people in the afternoon. I actually like to sort of do more of my thinking in the morning. So if I can, I try to keep a block of time open in the morning. But sometimes it's just not possible. You know, I have this thing called the teaching center. You know? and so they have my classes to, you know, from 10 to 11.30 on Monday and Wednesday morning. So therefore it's a little hard for me to do other things. So I think to some degree you could do that. And the second thing is you, you want to sort of keep a, a, a flow going balance going so you wouldn't want to sort of uh, have meetings every hour from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then nothing mm -hmm. the rest of the day. It, usually people I feel work best in 90 minutes segments and uh, an hour or 90 minutes. So I think you should try to do that to get a balanced schedule to get something that you know flows from your point of view. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you're, you're so constrained by everybody else's schedule that at least the levels I'm talking at, I, I think you're, 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 you're not able to do that that much. The key things, therefore, are two. One is to make sure you have some edgel, unscheduled time in the morning and afternoon uh, for thinking and for contingencies. And second of all, to when you go to all this stuff, to really try to be really explicit as to why you're going through this and what you want to get out of it. So you at least have a shot at it. Otherwise, a lot of people, you know, they go through a whole day and they come home and they say to their spouse, gee, I worked really hard today. I have no idea what the hell I got accomplished. And that's because they weren't pursuing any of their goals. They were probably just going from one thing to another, passively accepting everybody else's goals. And so at the end of the day, they couldn't tell you what they've really accomplished. You know, a lot of these ideas, when you, as you describe them, they sound like they, they, they make sense. And as you, as you said, there's, a, there's some basis in some research and other uh, evidence that supports them. But if it does kind of make sense, why is it so hard for people to do this? And you know, we talked earlier about uh, the fact that you teach this in a course for us here at the Sloan School, in several courses. How do you set about teaching this stuff in a way that actually makes a difference for people? Well, when I teach the course, we try to minimize the amount of lecture and have the most sort of in terms of people's actual experience, hands-on experience. So instead of just talking about the virtues of performance-based success metrics, we actually give them, uh, say, okay, the team is going to get together and here are the priorities, so let's see what your success metrics are. And what's interesting is for the same priorities, you could get 10 teams, each of which has a different set success metrics, which is okay, but it starts to show you uh, what the thing is. And so I think that's one thing. And uh, we also have, uh, we use case studies. We use case studies of real people. So we have a case study on somebody who's rising up in a company and they get to the point where they would have to sort of have a global job and what would be the implications of that mm -hmm. for their work-life balance for so we try to use real life situations and, and that sort of thing. And at the end, what we do is we ask people to break into partners and we give them a list of all the practical suggestions. And then we say, you and your partner have to discuss what you're going to commit to change when you leave. And we make them stand up and make a sort of commitment to the group. So those are some of the techniques we, we use. And, um, you know, then so far it's been successful. How much more helpful do you think it is to really practice these things in person? Because there are so many books, yourself included, <laughs> on this topic that we're all reading when we're wasting time in airports and other places. I think it's so much more important. There's so much, I mean, it's good to have a few ideas. And I like the fact that my book is short and sweet. It's got a lot of summaries and 
easy to read. Uh, but, um, and you know, it, it's, it, people like it. But really, it, unless you take these ideas and put them into a practical context and give people a chance to sort of really uh, sort of get their hands dirty and really try to see, well, how would you apply this? And then it's really important to do it with groups of people so that they can get the feedback of people from, you know, what they, what, how they're coming over and how there are different possible articles and different, excuse me, different part, possible arguments and different possible approaches. So I think that sort of interaction uh, is really critical. And, um, you know, if, if you can't do it in a two-day course, at least try to get together a group and, you know, sort of, more than just just reading. Otherwise, I think it's too abstract. You're very generously spending your time with us on this webinar. We'll have a Facebook chat continuation uh, shortly uh, as well. Uh, and of course, you're teaching this two-day course several times a year at MIT. That seems to suggest to me uh, that uh, this body of knowledge, these ideas, are uh, and sharing them were an important goal. Uh, yeah, for yeah. So I, I, I do really believe that because I really feel I mean, there's, I, I can't say that there are, you know, like my ideas in this book are like, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity. They're not huge new ideas. They're common sense ideas put together in a systematic and practical way. And I just see so many people struggling uh, with, you know, their daily routine and so many people struggling with how they balance these things that it just, you know, uh, the application of systemized common sense seems like a very good goal. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's time to wrap up this portion uh, of the of the webinar. Uh, thank you, Bob Posen, for sharing uh, your ideas on extreme productivity with us. Thank you to all uh, 2,500 people all over the world who registered and signed up for this uh, webinar. We're now going to uh, switch to the uh, Facebook uh, portion of uh, our live discussion. We had many more questions that came in than we were able to cover uh, in this Q&A session. So hopefully some of you will be able to stick with us. Uh, you'll be getting a link pushed by our webinar service shortly. Click on the link to join us in the Facebook uh, live uh, video discussion. Once again, thank you very much, Bob Posen. Thank you all, and hopefully we'll see many of you in a few minutes on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's event. This concludes our program. You may all disconnect and have a wonderful day.